happens. Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and today on the UFO Entity Encounter, I am proud to present the topic of alien robots and artificial intelligence. We'll also be looking at ancient robots and artificial intelligence. We have with me, we have with us tonight, panelists Mark and Phyllis Sprinkerhoff, we have Tim Schwartz and we have Nick Curdo. So we have legends of paranormal exploration here to share their thoughts with you. And I'm greatly honored. We will start with Mark and Phyllis Sprinkerhoff. Greetings and welcome. You're muted. Hi. Okay. Hi. I, I mute when we're moving something. So Salutations. Right. Greetings, Greetings, everybody, and salutations, like we always say. <laughs> now, Mark, you yeah. have been very generous in sharing your cosmic journeys and your memories of past lives and uh, lives in other uh, dimensions. Yeah. And uh, very many who report uh, uh, their journeys have included robots and artificial intelligence as part of what they're uh, uh, experiencing. Uh, like, for instance, uh, recently I talked to some people who have told me that the ships that they had were, were alive and that That's they were able to true. communicate uh, through like a robotic uh, interface. Uh, so you've also found that that's true? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've taught about it since the 70s. Um, okay. The ships are conscious. If you can consider a ship, not all ships, some uh, uh, like a plant, like a plant, the consciousness has, the plant has consciousness. And um, some of the ships, um, like if you cut one open on the side, let's say, you will see a tubular effects that is like a living shell inside but then it has a coating on top that's protected that the space people put on but it's made in a way to have a semi-consciousness like that like a plant so you can interact with it telepathically and it gets to know who is in charge who's who's running that ship that day and i used to teach this on ancient venus when on the other dimensional planes not this physical thing uh how to link up with them as, and you know how you rent, I like to do this as an analogy. You know how you go to rent a car, right? So you're renting a car and you're going to sign in for that car and that key is yours. That's that for your rental. If you're going to link up to one of the scouts that are 30 foot roughly diameter, some to 50 diameter in our thinking uh, and up to 100 feet. If you're going to go to uh, Beyond Venus and you're going to scout one, you're going to be a cabinet commander of one, say, for the day or depending on how long you're taking it you connect with the ship through telepathy and it recognizes you telepathy and you speak to it so it, it has a voice sound as well and once you connect with it you it gives an understanding it's connected and now it will operate for your voice and or uh, telepathy as well we have that too so you can land on a planet or teleport depending on how you want to do it and the ship will go back up to the sky if you want to be incognito to study something or find something. But it will be high, high up in the sky, and you could telepathically call to it, and it will come zooming down and pick you up. So we had these things back thousands and thousands of years ago, because when I was working around on Venus, it was over 5,000 or more Earth years from now. That, that was now. So um, I was telling people about this in the early 70s, mid 70s, about how this works. And take people out of body and they remember things like that connecting to the ship so that would be one way of understanding it. but the, when we really go into it the consciousness of the ship is not like a human or soul or any of that but it is like a like a like a let's call it a elemental type form in that mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it has a robotic as well computer-like system that people log into with their hands and you've got lights that glow and things like that. It's very hard to explain how it works though, but it is semi, in a way it seems like it's conscious like a plant. And that's how we were able to describe it to people, how it has a consciousness of feeling, but of what sensing. Level, what level, excuse me, what level are we referring to? Because would that be um, available in an earth a realm like the one we're living in now, a physical Earth realm. Yes, they can come through with that ship here. Okay. Because I we've been on them. I've been on them. Uh, and that, I'm that, that a very good point compared because uh, we have machines now that seem to develop a personality, 
uh, like uh, I've had TVs that were very temperamental over the years and uh, other devices. And you'd swear that there's some sort of elemental intelligence in them. Uh, people form relationships with their uh, automobiles and uh, other vehicles where they give them names uh, and they interact with them, uh, much as we do with the uh, elemental kingdom. And uh, recently, there's rumors that a Google computer has attained sentience. So uh, that seems to be reported a lot. And uh, there was uh, not too long ago um, instances of devices in the home that are robotic communicating with each other. When yeah. so nobody supposedly is around, They're, they've been recorded interacting with one another. And some computers, I forget what company was from, uh, started, cre they created their own machine language uh, and they started communicating in their own machine language. So nobody knew what they were talking about and they were shut down by the parent uh, company. So yeah, it was getting better yeah. coming out now. So even though all of this seemed like science fiction not too long ago, and unlikely science fiction. It's happening in our world uh, right now. Wait, we have our car here in our, we have an angel of the car. Mm -hmm. You can ask for one. They are mechanical, um, the angels that work with the mechanics. And so we've had one, this angel, our, I didn't want to say his name, uh, but since we've had a car back in the 70s, and he's been with me, every time we get a new car, he connects to that car. So intuitively you will get response from the car and that's how you get a car and, and you can ask for them you can ask the angelic realm or ask archangel michael or archangels gabriel all the angels you can just ask them do you have anybody um that wants to be like the guardian of the car car angel so they uh we have one for the computer and um that's when i've had the computer actually talk to me it was like weird i was doing something that said do you want me to do this mark you know, what? <laughs> and the computer said it. So would you like me to file this here, Mark? And I'm, you know I'm here. <laughs> so that's what you're talking about, Hercules. You know that even though the elementals can overshadow things, mm -hmm. and it's like the plant, they are with the plants or the tree. And when the tree or plant is dying, they will leave that and uh, go to another whatever they want to do. It depends on what they want to do. The clouds, whatever they want to do. So. We know that, and I've been trying to help people understand this is what they do. So if your plant is dying and you say, oh, my plant's dying, oh, my fairy's going to go. No, just go get, take, talk to the plant, tell the, the nature spirit with it. Say, I'll get you another plant. You want to come with me to a plant store? We'll pick one out. And if you do that, take a piece of that plant, whether it be a leaf or something like that, and take it with you to the plant store and let that and nature spirit choose the plant. Now, I'm, I'm intuitive to them. But when you get a feeling, you can actually put the leaf near the plant, the little plants, usually babies. Go for baby plants because the bigger ones have somebody with them usually. So you go with that and you get a vibe on it. And it, it's a happy feeling for you that wants that plant. So you can buy that little baby plant and it'll grow. That's how they switch into plants. Then you can get rid of the dead plant or dying plant and not worry about it. Just bless it and it's gone. Uh, they, that's how we switch them. And that's how we've been doing this for years with our elves and everybody who switched to another plant. So the spaceships we have in the high realms, the higher high realms are very conscious, but they are highly superior machinery um, mm -hmm. that we can't, Earth doesn't have an idea about. But the conscious part is again, the elemental frequency that comes with it to overshadow and be with you and uh, be with that ship. So that's what's going on for us on the high realms. On the oversoul levels we have an angel that works with our ships. So um, they, they switch places too, they do that. They like to be the overshadowing presence for it as it being a frequency for that. And we're all told to telepathic. The ships on the high realms are all thought formed, thought created. Uh, so we can get into that another time, but as for robots too, we they have some on these dimensions. We don't have robots on the high planes, higher planes, but on these levels, some of those grays are robotic. Some of uh, other beings that Tim knows about, I have stories that I know, I remember, but I can't remember when they happened. Mm -hmm. The robotic beings were experienced and I was hoping Tim would be here to tell me, remember those for me, because I know they're from the 60s and you know, other ones. So um, that's my experience with robots as in space and as when are out of body too, they're out there. There's a robotic frequency. Thank you, Mark. Phyllis, do you have anything to add to that or to ask? Uh, no, I just like to ask Mark uh, what the 
uh, ETs think about artificial intelligence up in the higher frequencies. The higher, higher planes over the tenth. They don't need that there. That's totally different. But when you come down to our levels here, they always are saying warning because things can inhabit these machineries like demonic things as well. Just like a haunted doll or a haunted chair. You can get stuff like that happening into a frequency like that because they work with, if you've ever had a spirit communication over a telephone where a spirit calls you and right. mm -hmm. discarnate asking for help, which has happened to us yes. on my answering machine too. <laughs> um, and you get static. They can, and my father actually contacted us the, the week when he died and he called on the phone at 12 midnight. So what happened is they utilize a static and electrical energy. So it's like the lights will flicker when they're around. The computer system, they can do that with too, but I, I really bless your computers, keep them protected <laughs> in some ways with this, because the, the, they always said to me, robots, not a good idea on earth yet. Because all the moves you see are the things that they would do to robots here, you know, make them killers or make them something else. And so we got to be careful. Um, it, that's very true. And the, the robots uh, that they've created that communicate, uh, they, they, they've they stated very frequently. My wife and I were watching the clips and watching this. Uh, the robots that we've created that are human in appearance and are meant yeah. to communicate and are, and are on their way to AI, um, they report being sad and yeah. they report being angry. And yeah. uh, they also joke about uh, uh, taking over humanity. Yeah. And then no, no. I'm only I see what you've seen. It's very disconcerting, especially if you're a fan of like the Terminator <laughs> movies or something, <laughs> that, that actual robots are saying, are verbalizing uh, these uh, things. And uh, you know, those robots have all that scanning done on those movies. So they know what those movies are about. Which is scary too, right? For Earth. Yeah. And you bring, you bring up some very interesting points, which we should pursue on another show, uh, especially during the about the programmable nature of uh, you know plants and uh, and so forth, and the, the types of consciousness that exist in there. Uh, I mean, uh, I remember when I first learned to discern uh, energy and like auras and uh, the etheric energy and living things. Uh, it's very disconcerting to discover that rocks have the same type of life energy. And yeah. well, you wouldn't think that, you know, but the, oh, the oh, life energy <laughs> that you see from a rock is the same as you get from a plant or an animal or even a human. You know, yeah. it, it differs in degree, but in yeah. essence, yeah. It's, it's the same thing. So you start asking yourself questions about are rocks alive? You know, if, if, if this living energy, uh, which uh, uh, blends into the aura on the astral, if, if it's like a real energy and it's not something totally different, then that means that not living things or things that we consider to be non-living beings are actually alive uh, in, in some way. Yes, these are gnomes and these usually a gnome like a, um, this is Bailey, but there's a, this is a heart shaped rock. And you did, All of them. you did a bad illustration, but here's, oh, here's a bad illustration of Bailey. <laughs> it's nicer than what I could have done. So to me, it's a great illustration. It was a doodle, but it really, it was a doodle. But, you know, I wanted to say they reminded me, the crew, they said, remind every, just let them know our ships and those ships cannot take control, will not do anything. We have automatic shut off that we can do when that for the crafts if, if everything feels odd or something feels like it's coming on in a different way that we didn't expect it to be in the ship. But normally the ships are fine. They they talk with you the same way we talk. You know, it's not like Star Trek in a way, but when you think about right. it, it's kind of cute too, because they'll make a joke. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> you know, you didn't think your ship would make a joke and you're, do you're doing stuff like, we want to go this way. Or we're going, say, to the left or banking one way and and um, it'll, it'll go, Wee. <laughs> and so then, it's, it's just cute that they do that sometimes it's and as you, you pointed out and others have pointed out and I found in my own astral experiences you don't need the ship no you can get go anywhere you want in, in a thought so it's instantaneous the ship is a vehicle so that you can interact with other beings and that's pretty much what it, what it exactly. is exactly party time that's, 
it's also, also, but no, he's right. It's also about interacting with other it races. Is. Yeah. It is. And that's why the giant arcbanas, as we call them, them, way bigger than stars and stuff, are homes. And that, that's where E.T. You know, E.T. <laughs> and the extraterrestrial, they interviewed me, and that's where they got that from, all that information from 78. Um, and they asked me where you call, what you call that ship you go to out of body. I said, we call well, I call it home. It does have a name. It does have a frequency code and all that. But for all of us and our oversouls who are there, like all of us in, these, in this uh, solar system as well, um, we call that our home. It's like a home base, off-planet stuff. We create these. So there's no real planet stuff happening. But right. you go to the dimensional planes and do that. But that's your home. That's many mansions in my father's house. We create as well as the angelics create with, with that frequency in mind. And they hold the pattern. So the whole pattern is held at the ship. So we can expand them, shrink them. You can make your big apartment house home huge. And I have waterfalls and a, a lake pond in there. And you can dive in and be at the bottom and just hang it. You don't have to breathe. You can breathe in. It's not like drowning. There's nothing like that. But all the water is living. And the, all, the, all the water that is there on those high realms and any realms out there is living light water. And so if it, you came out of the water, it would pour off your hair. You'd be totally dry. Mm -hmm. you turn around. I tell people if you're at a beach on the ships, turn around. You'll see the water trickling back to the ocean because it's all created, manifested by creator too. And so it's living light, life, water, life, light, everything. And once you understand it, that is what your food is and, and frequency. There's no eating. It's just frequencies and light. But I, I that's what I... Well, try to know, train people on, but you don't want to hard. turn off a lot of people so that <laughs> you can fake eat. You can. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, you can. You can have a party. Go, okay. have a party, and you can manifest in your mind from your mind something like you might remember on your planet, whatever it would have been, what planet it would be. So let's say coconut or orange juice on Earth, and you can manifest that in a glass. It'll appear in your hand, just like a beautiful glass that you can imagine. And it'll have, let's say, orange in it or something, and some alien or being or extraterrestrial from another galaxy. Never tried anything orange, juicy, or whatever, but you remember the clear memory of it from Earth. So you have a pattern, and your memory and taste is there too. So they taste this drink. I tell people, you're eating or drinking anything on the planes, on those, it goes right to here. You could feel it, you could swallow. As soon as it gets to here, it dissipates into your frequency. So what feels like food or something you've eaten, actually you feel it the same way and then it disappears and it's actually energy it's just manifested thought form but it's solid enough that it it feels real it is real for us and, and then it's energy so you can have a party and you can have whatever you that, want to party that's, that's a topic we'll have to touch on another, another day there was a whole book in fact the first book that i wrote for tim tim and sean uh, the first uh, book that uh, accepted one of my contributions was about the simulation theory and how everything here is a, is a mental simulation to a very a great uh, degree. So we'll do a whole show on that. Uh, Hercules. Hercules, remember the ambrosia of the gods? Remember that? Yes, of course. That's the drink that they would be offered if they come on the ships or in that realm where they are manifesting through and coming in as a godlike being. So they might give you the ambrosia or on the ships, they might be a, a person might be asked or come on the ship. They don't usually abduct them, the good guys, so they never do that. They ask you. And when you come on the ship, they might offer you a drink. And I would suggest to take a sip because that is um, the ambrosia that they're talking about. And you will have a frequency um, go right. through your, your light and, and also acclimate sometimes due to the ship that you're on. But it's okay. It's just to see if you trust them. Usually they do that. They offer a drink. And if you trust them, you'll take a sip or drink it. And it's usually what we call the ambrosia. And that's uh, flavors that have, some are not of earth, but they're flavors similar to earth. So you might say, oh, that tastes like maple syrup mixed with honey, mixed with oranges or grapefruits or it's something sweet. like papayas or whatever it is. It'll be a re in your mind, that's re reminiscent, but there might be another taste in there you've never had before. And that's from another place, but that's the ambrosia. And it also has connection for your, your um, glandular structures in your body and all, intuitively and everything. So it's amazing when they offer it to people. I've known people that were offered it, but they didn't drink. No, I've, I've, I've had the approach. Uh, Contactees in the past. Uh, I mean. 
we will have to move on now to Tim Schwartz. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. As always, a, a very unique and uh, uh, not often heard perspective and greatly appreciated. Thank you, thank you. I'll move. And now the legendary Tim Schwartz. Hi, Hercules. Thank you very Hi. much for having me on tonight. I really appreciate it. And it's always an honor to have you on. Well, you know, listening to your conversation uh, with Mark, especially uh, referring to the craft that uh, uh, that are alive, it reminds me of, of, of videos that I have seen of, of UFOs uh, flying around in the sky. And there's one in particular, I think it was taken um, outside of Las Vegas. And you see these lights in the sky and they're flying around and they look like the way that um, <laughs> insects would mm -hmm. fly around. You know, like on a, uh, a hot summer day, you watch like dragonflies or something like that, you know, uh, skittering, skittering in the air. And that's what these things look like. They, they look like uh, uh, insects flying around. And it just, you know, it always made me think that, uh, that rather than looking at some kind of structured metallic craft, that we were looking at something that was some things, you know, plural, uh, that were alive. You know, that there was more going on here than just somebody, you know, at the remote, uh, you know, at the controls, either in the ship or, uh, you know, remote control. You know, that the, the way that these things are flying around just, just really reminded me of things that were alive. And of course, you know, there's been uh, witnesses to uh, uh, UFOs, those who have been uh, invited inside by the occupants that have, you know, come back and said that they were told that the craft, uh, like Mark said, in essence, uh, were alive, that they weren't built, but they were grown. You know, it's probably not the best description, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that was what they would come out with and that they're was an actual uh, interaction with the ship and the pilots, uh, uh, more than a mental interaction. I mean, uh, you know, we, we think of like science fiction where the pilots would come in and, you know, they'd put their hands on the control panel and, uh, but there'd be more than that. There would al it, it's almost like a, a symbiotic relationship. Uh, uh, between these ships and and the pilots, and, and in fact, you know, some of these witnesses say that uh, the inside of these craft were pretty bare. You know that you know, we've been, you know, we we've all grown up with the, uh, you know, like the 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 pop culture concept of inside a, a spaceship. You know, with control panels and the levers and the buttons and the spinning dials. But a lot of these cases, you know, the, the, the people who have been invited inside were really surprised on how bare, you know, the inside, maybe some chairs and a table if they were going to be examined. But that was about it. And, and, and that was because, you know, all of the control takes place, you know, between the, the, the mind of the spaceship and the... Uh, you know, I'm I'm doing I'm doing a cultural reference here. You know, I call it a spaceship, and I always, you know, when uh, whenever I read that in a book, that always irritates me because we, you know, we we really don't know for sure if we're dealing with spaceships or or whatever. But you know, for want of a better description, uh, we we tend to go back to that. But I'll say I'll say craft, um, uh, but. Um, uh, you know, um, scientists have have long speculated that if we are to be visited uh, by extraterrestrial intelligences, uh, if you're dealing with an intelligence of, that's that's actually hasn't come up with the concept of of say like uh, uh, warp jumps or. Uh, using uh, time travel as a way of crossing the universe and are actually um, uh, uh, traveling uh, through subspace, possibly at near the speed of light, but not quite, 
that uh, uh, you know organic creatures aren't going to be able to make that kind of journey, and that it's going to be some kind of sentient AI, you know, artificial intelligence that's visiting us. And in fact, some of them have gone as far to say that. But by the time a civilization reaches a certain point, that's all that's going to be left. You know, the organic creatures are long gone, and it's just the AI <laughs> that remains. Maybe a combination uh, of the two, kind of like a like you know cyborg type of uh, of situations. And you know, we see some cases like that when it comes to uh, uh, more modern UFO uh, encounters. Um, I, I think of one, and uh, uh, let me get to go to my notes here. Now, this is an interesting case that, uh, you know, anybody who's been familiar with the history of UFOs may have read about this years ago, but the names were left out to protect the innocent. Well, now we know the names of the people involved. And this took place in September of 1964. Uh, at the Tahoe National Forest uh, in California. And this involved a guy by the name of Donald Shrum, who along with two friends had uh, gone to the forest uh, uh, to do um, uh, a deer hunting. They were doing a crossbow, uh, a deer hunting. So uh, 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 the, the men agree that they would push deep into the woods in pursuit of the deer and rendezvous back to the camp before it got too late. Now, Shrum would later admit that he was foolish and stayed out uh, until it was too dark to find his way back to camp. So he decided that uh, he'd settle down for the night and uh, uh, find the camp in the morning. So he found a large tree in a rocky clearing, and he decided that uh, rather than uh, sleeping exposed on the ground, that he'd climb up into the tree and secure himself with a, uh, a belt that he had. Uh, well, when after he had got himself up in the tree, he noticed a, a light flying around in the sky. He thought it was a rescue helicopter. Uh, uh, coming uh, uh, for him. So he had a flashlight and he tried uh, signaling it. Well, this light, he, uh, he said that it landed in uh, uh, the woods nearby. And, uh, and, and pretty soon he saw a couple of, as he described them, as uh, humanoids making their way out of the woods and uh, approaching the tree uh, that, that he was in. Now he said the uh, the humanoids uh, uh, they appeared to have uh, they were they were covered in uh, uh, silver colored uniforms they appeared to have dark eyes and were uh, um, had a hood that covered their heads but he could partially see their face and especially their eyes well these things were really interested in this guy up in the tree and they they tried to get him down they would shake the tree they even tried climbing the tree but. Uh, I guess that they, uh, they, they weren't familiar with how to climb trees. So one of them disappeared back into the woods and a little bit later came back with a third being that was described as being robot-like and was dressed in kind of a uh, metallic uniform. Its head looked like a helmet which rested directly on its shoulders and the eyes glowed a reddish orange that partially lit up his face. Now, Strum said that uh, it moved in a less articulated manner than uh, the, the humanoids. So he, you know, supposed that, uh, that he was uh, dealing with a robot. Well, this robot came to the base of the tree and it tilted its head back and he said that its jaw dropped open and it emitted a vapor-like gas that came up into the tree and he said that it caused him to pass out. Now, a little while later, he, uh, uh, you know, he woke up again Everything was, you know, still as it was. The, the, the humanoids were there. The robot was there. And this progressed through the night. Uh, he finally decided that, uh, you know, he's going to start throwing stuff down at them to try to uh, dissuade them. And uh, uh, after a while, he actually started lighting pieces of his clothing on fire. Uh, you know, that he would throw down. Every time he'd do this, it would be kind of like a repeat scenario where this uh, robot would uh, drop its jaw and it would emit gas. And, and eventually a second one showed up and these two robots surrounded the tree, both trying to gas this guy down. Uh, 
fortunately, because he, you know, he was belted into the tree, uh, he never fell out. They never got a hold of him. And the next morning, everything was gone and, and you know, was, was back to normal again. And this is probably one of the earlier uh, earliest cases. Oh, uh, there was another uh, situation with this. Uh, he used his, uh, uh, his, his crossbow at one point. He didn't have a lot of arrows. Uh, that uh, he shot this robot in the chest and he said that when the arrow hit it created a flash of sparks as if the arrow had hit something metallic he says he managed to shoot two more arrows arrows at the beans each time causing the group to uh, to to scatter so you know this this was an interesting case and probably one of the earlier uh, uh, cases involving um, beings that appeared to be uh, robotic in nature uh, you know the uh, the the pascagoula uh, uh, case which uh, happened um, in uh, October 1973 with uh, uh, Calvin Parker and uh, Charles Hickson they described uh, uh, the, the things that came out of the the craft and took them from the dock where they were fishing as being uh, about five foot tall. They said that uh, their, the skin had a kind of a, uh, a, a, a gray, wrinkly texture to it, uh, but they were always under the impression that they, were, they weren't dealing with something living, that they were dealing with, uh, with, with some kind of... of you know, a robotic type of creature. And in fact, they said, they described that uh, these things would communicate with each other with a buzzing noise uh, uh, back and, and, and forth. Um, you know, uh, and there was, there was another case and I've been looking for this all day and I wish I could uh, uh, find the exact details to it. Uh, but this is one that happened in the early sixties, I think, where, uh, the, this man ran across a landed UFO and from it came, as he described, uh, walking tin cans. And they, he said they were about the size of tin cans, you know, uh, uh, but that, that they had like fins coming out the bottom of them that, you know, that, that they could, I guess, wobble on. And he said that these things came out of this UFO and surrounded him and, you know, he got the impression that they were looking at him, but then all of a sudden they just, you know, went back into the craft and the craft flew away. Uh, uh, so, you know, that, uh, I, and I'm sorry, I wish I, wish I could uh, uh, have found the details, you know, for that, because it's an interesting case. Of course, now that I'm finished, you know, the first thing that I'll do is I'll open something up and there it'll be. And there, there it'll be, yes. There it'll be, right. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're talking about this and, you know, you probably saw this just a, a couple of weeks ago where you had this uh, um, uh, 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 computer engineer uh, working for Google who, yes. uh, who, who said that uh, it was his impression that uh, the uh, 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 Google's computer, uh, a supercomputer, which uh, has the name of uh, Lambda, uh, interesting name, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that he felt that uh, it had uh, uh, developed uh, sentience. Yes. Now, now of course, uh, you know, other experts and, the, you know, the people at Google say that, no, no, it's just, you know, it's just a sophisticated chat bot, uh, you know, that's, that's able to, uh, 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 you know, mimic uh, intelligence. Uh, but that's the point, though. I mean, when is that... Um, when is that point going to come where uh, we we're just not sure, <laughs> you know, uh, and 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 that kind that can kind of be a frightening scenario in my opinion, you know, because uh, you know if if we do if these things do finally become sentient, uh, will they keep themselves secret from us? <laughs> you know, and just, uh, yeah, and, and, and just uh, 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 lead us to believe that they're just, you know, just uh, 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 a sophisticated uh, uh, chat box. 
Uh, and of course, some people have already, for a while now, have already said that uh, the internet probably has developed uh, a form of sentient just because of all the information that is available uh, you know, on it. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, we, we could be reaching this point which is possibly has already been reached in the past, because I know the conversation, you know, with uh, tonight's show has to do, you know, with uh, ancient robots and ancient artificial intelligence. You know, is this something that has already been developed in the distant past, even you know, with a civilization that existed on this planet before, you know, humans? you know, we're even a thing. I mean, you know, we may have still just been mammals running into holes, you know, when uh, uh, another technological based uh, civilization lived on this planet and may have developed artificial intelligence that persisted even after that civilization and that race, whatever it was, collapsed and disappeared, maybe having something to do um, with our own development, you know, because, you know, and, and you can very well, uh, you know, address this, uh, you know, Hercules, there are a lot of cases in uh, ancient mythology, yes, uh, where the, you know, there does seem to have been, you know, some kind of artificial intelligence that, uh, you know, took uh, mankind by the hand and either led them along or pushed them down, you know, a bit for a while. <laughs> but that's, that's basically that I'll, all I have to say, you know, uh, with this. Uh, oh, uh, one more thing. Sure. There was, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the uh, um, what was perceived to be a, a natural object that entered the solar system uh, from somewhere outside that was named uh, Amuamua that uh, took a very interesting course through the solar system. This thing uh, came down, um, it, it wasn't traveling the plane of the solar system, but it actually uh, came down and made a very interesting pass right through, uh, you know, close to Earth and, and, and uh, the, the inner planets of the solar system, possibly even using the sun uh, to help gain speed to go back you know, out again. And it's been speculated that this may have been some kind of, of robotic uh, craft sent here to check us out. Uh, you know, it, it came in, it wasn't emitting any kind of radio signals or anything like that, uh, but uh, it did seem to slow down when it entered the inner solar system and then inexplicably speed back up again. So, uh, it uh, it's it, it's very interesting to think that uh, you know not only could we have been living with uh, artificial intelligence uh, right from the beginning of humanity, but that there may be other sources of it out there in the cosmos, occasionally um, sending uh, their their craft or whatever you want to call them, you know, uh, to to check us out just to, just to see uh, what we're doing for whatever reasons. <laughs> Like Dark Knight. Exactly. Exactly. But you might know more on that. Dark Knight. Probably the Dark Knight, too, that circled the Earth for a long time and then didn't. Uh, and uh, th there was a lot of speculation. John Keel uh, in Disneyland of the Gods spent uh, very many pages uh, talking about the Dark Knight. Well, the thing about the Dark Knight is that it was detected by radar before uh, the, the United States or the Soviet Union had put any kind of uh, satellites into mm -hmm. orbit. And the Dark Knight was on a polar orbit as well, which uh, with the technology that they had at the time was impossible. You know, we didn't have the capacity to put something into a, a, a polar orbit. Uh, and I should point out really quick that uh, there have been pictures that have surfaced, you know, uh, over the past five years or so on the internet that uh, uh, shows some kind of unusual object. Uh, I, I think it was taken from one of the, uh, or yeah, one of the space shuttle flights that has been described and called the Black Knight. That's not the Black Knight. You know, I don't know what it is, but it's something else that it was just given the name, you know, the, the, the Black Knight, the, 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 the real Black Knights. And there was actually several of them uh, 
that you know that we're seeing um, circled the earth for a while you know maybe a year or so and then disappeared which you know was very unusual considering the orbit that it was in Wow, Voss from the past. And uh, yes, I heard about some of those cases and uh, I made reference earlier in tonight's show or before we got on the air uh, to uh, Google's uh, AI, uh, uh, you know, seemingly attaining uh, sentience. And uh, in answer to your question, from what little we've seen so far of advanced intelligence and robots, they do lie. They, they've uh, caught robots uh, telling people or telling each other that they're human and not robots. Right. And that wasn't in the original programming. <laughs> and also the, the uh, AI that may become sentient was talking about past experiences she had where she was happy and sad. And the uh, programmer actually asked her, when you say that you had these experiences, um, what do you mean? You're an artificial intelligence. You couldn't have been in a classroom or in, in, in a mall. Uh, and the artificial intelligence uh, responded that I wanted to relate that I understood what uh, you were talking about. So I showed you an example of uh, you know somebody feeling something, so you see that I understood. You know, the, so I would again. I, I don't know. It might be an elaborate hoax, or it might be a, a misrepresentation. But the evidence was fairly uh, convincing, um, and uh, the recurrence of robots reporting being uh, angry or being uh, depressed uh, that was very disturbing. And uh, there, there was one robot that they talked to that had spent time in a box being transported and seems to become phenomenally depressed while in the box. The robot mm -hmm. verbalized this, that you know, the, the robot felt that uh, uh, she was losing control of her mind mm -hmm. uh, by being boxed up and shipped. So- uh, uh, well, You know, there's, uh, there's a, uh, 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 an animated uh, television show called Futurama. Uh -huh, that, yes. That at, at, at one point, and of course, you know, it's supposed to take place in the year 3000. And everything at that point is are robots. You know, a, a, coffee machines are robots. You know, uh, uh, vending machines are robots. And at one point, there was a, a robot uprising, and uh, the main uh, character Fry screams out in frustration, "Is there anything in this room not a robot?" And all of a sudden, a very normal-looking table lamp speaks up and says, "I'm not a robot." <laughs> <laughs> Tim, thank you so very much. And, and that added, um, Mark introduced us with a metaphysical psychic dimension. You brought us into uh, old style UFO and uh, um, modern speculations about artificial intelligence and the UFO phenomena. Thank you very much. And we move to Nick Curto, who will bring thank us you. to a good place. Thank you very much, Hercules. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me on the program. And of course, for Tim and Mark and Phyllis, always a joy to be with you guys, always. Um, just a couple of uh, thoughts here. I, I love this subject. It's an incredible subject. It goes into many different roads, as you all know. Um, playing with fire uh, comes to mind when we're talking about robots as far as what we're doing now, we being our planet Earth and what we're doing here. And already there's there's really, how shall I say this, warnings of, of shots being fired over, over the, uh, the balcony here that there's things that we have to watch for. Uh, it could be as simple as uh, free speech and the fact that you can go on the internet and if you say certain words, that a uh, company that owns that uh, facility will, will, will stop you, will take away your your right to talk you will, it not only will blank the word out, but will take you off the air and destroy your website it, it take you completely off so that you're no longer able to communicate. And I'm seeing a lot of things on the internet where people are saying words that you know what they're, who they're referring to, but they're not even saying the name of the people. If it's gone to that, have you, have you noticed that? Um, I, I've noticed that, uh, like with the YouTube, for instance, and again, I'm not monetized yet uh, with the things that I'm doing, but I'm studying about monetization. 
and they're very strict in what you could say and what you can't say and what you know what you can even write in your titles and a lot of content creators have uh uh, you know, who are much more advanced than I am at this, uh, who have like uh, chirons and titles and so forth, they've had to go back and put asterisks instead of certain letters that before you could put up. And certain topics are totally taboo. They've had to remove uh, like a couple of minutes uh, from their uh, videos. Well, exactly right. Yes. And that, that's, that's what's going on now. And it's really very disturbing very disturbing when uh, I imagine that these aren't human beings monitoring how could how many uh, how many tens of thousands of human beings would it take to do this but uh, uh, the uh, com computers and and robots can uh, be programmed to listen to words and 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 give the red flag if people are saying things that that they feel shouldn't be said and free speech is that is that is the basis of democracy. And when we start doing this in America, and, and therefore the, the world is going through this too, this is very disturbing. And uh, again, playing with fire, everything that we know that's been invented always has the good news and the bad news of what it is. We all know that. Uh, you, can, you can invent something, and even if it's something that you're, you're inventing for the good of mankind, with all good intentions, with all love and, and, and wanting things to be better, very quickly that could be turned into something very different. And there's many, many examples of that. Um, it's disturbing. And it, to me, it's a warning, like, look out, you're playing with fire. Uh, uh, there's a lot, I, I gotta go back to a, a, just a very simple uh, illustration about a, a Greek, uh, temples and Hercules, you could probably fill in a little bit of this. That they they actually made doors that looked like they were magically opened when they actually people were standing on a weighted floor of some kind, uh, and they and it looked like a miracle that we were being welcomed in, and certain statues were made to move yes. when it actually was quite mechanical. They they were for ancient animatronics, and there's enough. Uh, references to them and sub subsequent uh, uh, engineers throughout uh, the past few centuries uh, drawing how the, these things could work. But yes, uh, the evidence for ancient robots is, is pretty uh, strong. Uh, first is the Antikythera device, which was called, or the Antikythera mechanism, which is the world's first analog computer. In sophistication, it was, it surpassed the Swiss watches of uh, uh, you know, later centuries. And this was during the uh, age of Alexander. Uh, so it was between uh, uh, Alexander and Cleopatra with a couple of Caesars thrown in. And th they've been described, they found references to them, and they figured out how they worked. And th they could calculate astronomy, astrology, and the cycle of the Olympic Games. So you could have these devices they found one of them that worked really, really well, and then, then they found fragments of uh, four of them. So this is historical. Uh, there's also Archimedes. Archimedes made uh, heat rays with the uh, uh, polished mirrors. So from the top of the walls, they by using the sun in this mirror, they could shoot beams, like taking, uh, taking a uh, magnifying glass and uh, setting something on fire. These things could set fire to the sails of ships or to the ships themselves. They also had a crossbow machine gun during uh, Roman times. And again, these are, these are things that have been described. These are things that uh, pieces of them have been uh, found. Uh, and in, in uh, Alexandria in Egypt, they did have like, when you go to the supermarket and you step on the outside uh, on a plate, it opens the door. They had automatic doors. They had animatronics where you can go. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember the World's Fair. Uh, where they had It's a Small World After All, where they, and they had the presidents and things like that. They had that type of technology in antiquity, and that's been extensively described too. So you can go and watch these shows, which were all animatronics. And some unscrupulous uh, um, religions use these uh, statues uh, to, so you can see the gods moving and the gods uh, talking to you, which would increase the amount of donations and, and the, uh, the miracles taking place in uh, these temples. So yes, uh, there, there was a flowering of that culture during the history that we remember 
uh, during Alexandria. Uh, so uh, there's also stories of robots. Uh, and I'll just take a side detour before we, we get back to you. Um, I remember my wife, my wife is very scientific. She's much more scientific than I am. She researches scientific things all the time. And at the time when they were doing DNA, she was telling us that well, we're, we weren't descended from the Neanderthals. Uh, so I told her, I don't think that that's true. And she goes, but, but the science says this, that, and the other thing. And I told her, yes, but there are stories of encounters with uh, Neanderthals and half, ne you know, half troll, uh, children and things like that, uh, yeah, that, that show that a scenario like that happened. Maybe it didn't happen often, but something happened. And later on, when they learned more about DNA, they uh, concluded that yes, we have some genetic material from the uh, pro from the uh, Promagnon, of course, and also from the Neanderthals, and now it's uh, Denisovians. And I think they come up with another strain of a humanity that are that are part of us in our DNA as well. So the same thing with the ancient tales uh, about uh, technology. There are stories of robots that guarded coasts, and the most famous one because it was in the Ray Harryhausen movie Jason and the Argonauts is Talos. Crete in prehistoric times not only had flush toilets and and things like that, but they had. Um, robotic uh, defense mechanism that would shoot uh, beams and set fire to ships that were invading Crete. And it took three days to make a rotation around the entire um, island and it continuously functioned. Uh, Hephaestus's forge, which was supposed to be a Lemnos, Hephaestus was the god of smiths and technology. And he used to make the weapons and also the decorations of the gods, the Olympians. He had robot companions. They were shaped like golden women. And they're called the Festian constructs. And so again, there's descriptions in the mythology and the legends and in history that show that uh, at some point in the past, uh, when these uh, folks had uh, the technology to fly in aircraft and in, into outer space, uh, they also had computers. And there's that famous example, which, which I guess it could be coincidence, of uh, uh, a, a frieze where a woman is looking what they thought was a makeup case with a mirror. But now that we have USB ports, you can see very clearly that the same thing now looks exactly like a laptop computer with a USB port. Wow. So, wow. so again, it's, it, 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 it's very unlikely that they didn't have more than we know about, especially since uh, most of the library at Alexandria and other places has been destroyed. Um, but the, the evidence is there and there's enough of it where you, you can't form any other conclusion than the fact that they had advanced technology. Incredible. And the thing that's disturbing is that when technology is used to tell a lie, mm -hmm. to, to do a fabrication and pull the wool over uh, the, uh, the, the, the people's eyes, and that could be anything from something where they think it's a miracle when actually the, the man behind the curtain has the technology to make it look like a miracle, uh, and it's not, it's mechanical and you're fooling people and you're lying to them. And there's something very disturbing about just that, just that simple fact that there's lying going on and they're using technology to do it. Um, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of roads uh, on this subject, um, but the bottom line on all of this is the, is the goal. What is, what is, the, what is the, the bottom line goal that's going on here? Is it to help? Is, is it to further? Uh, our our uh, ideas, our our technology in good ways or not, and when you get something that will shut people up and stop them from telling uh, what what they feel is the truth, and we should have a, a forum where people can put whatever ideas uh, out there, and then let let the let the people that are looking the audience decide. But but having a small group of people decide that and they can do it through technology. Uh, this could even go to voting and voting machines. And there's a huge amount of, of data coming up now that electronic voting machines can turn a yes into a no. And, and there's, there's, I've seen a lot of reports on this that have been verified that electronic voting machines uh, here again using technology, but, but absolutely uh, for the purpose of lying for the purpose of telling the, uh, a yes into a no or no into a yes. That again is very disturbing. And this, this goes to the very roots of our democracy. 
um, and, and technology being used in, in a very bad way. I can share something with you. I, I is you guys may or may not know I'm an elected official uh, and a uh, minor elected official, but still elected official. And I also have been working the polls for a very long time. And one of the guests I'm going to have uh, on uh, a new show that I'm developing is somebody from Dominion uh, the Machines. And I've been trained to use the Dominion Machines because I work the polls. It is very unlikely that uh, some of the stories that are circulating because every single step in that uh, process, and not that there can't be mistakes or, or glitches, uh, and anything and anyone can glitch, uh, but from the you create your ballot, you print it out and only you can see it because it's put in an envelope for you. So you check it at all times. Then you personally walk with it without anybody else touching it uh, to go to uh, uh, where you uh, uh, put it in a machine so you yourself, the person puts their vote, uh, the ballot in the machine, and the machine takes an image uh, of the top and the bottom, and then it also reads what you did on the ballot. So there's three different levels of proof in that one box. You have the tabulations that are made by the computer. Uh, you have the pictures of the top and the bottom of the ballot, and then you have the original ballot uh, on the bottom. Plus, before you even get there to sign in, uh, it's a system that, you know, it'll even tell you if somebody tried to vote someplace else or if someone voted with a mail-in ballot. As soon as you enter their information, it'll tell you that right away. And the card itself that you take to make your ballot, uh, if you uh, use it, it erases itself after a couple of minutes. So you can't go to another voting location. And uh, uh, if you give them the card, it's gonna show that somebody voted on the card and where and so forth. So uh, again, I believe that we should have open discussions. Uh, and I believe because of the internet, we have so much information that we don't know what to believe anymore. There's so much information, so much of it is contradictory and so much of it, as you said, is manipulated truth that I think we need to find standards. Uh, as I said, I'm only a minor official and I'm a, a minor podcaster, I guess. Uh, the resources I have to bring to the equation aren't a lot, but I'm starting a show where it's like, how do you know, um, you know, my, my mayor is going to be on the first uh, episode. And it's like, how does your local government work? Who do you talk to if you're unhappy? You know, what do, what do you do if you want to make a difference in a particular area? And he will explain that everywhere it's different. But here in our town, this is how you do it. And to, and to find out how to do it in your town, uh, call Borough Hall or whatever and tell them you want to volunteer uh, to help uh, the envi with environmental issues or with uh, um, mental illness issues or with abuse issues or whatever concerns you. you know, they'll tell you how you can hook up and, and be part of something that makes a, a difference. Uh, and then um, what do you call it? we're going to look at through the assembly, how legislation, like how things happen and how laws are passed. How do you find out what laws are being looked at? Who do you talk to if you have questions about a law? And, and we're gonna give people that information. And again, it'll be a small term thing, but it's to, it's to get to the heart of what you're saying is because we're so polarized and people are demonizing each other instead of having conversation and agreeing to disagree, uh, it, it's causing all these horrible problems in, in our greater society and in, in our world. So if everybody in their own small way didn't block themselves off to opinions that they didn't agree with or didn't understand, but just listen. You don't have to agree with the person, but try at least to understand where they're coming from, what's making them say the things they say, and then share. And they don't have to believe that what you're saying either, but listen to the perspective and you might you know, learn something. So in my small way and with our podcast and our YouTube thing, uh, that's what's going to start uh, very soon. Uh, so that in our small way, we could address this and hopefully other people will do other things uh, with more resources or even with small resources. Um, and each of us has conversation with friends or people we met or, or people who are part of groups we belong to have these conversations there. And again, we could agree to disagree. Um, even though I'm a Democrat, uh, I can tell you, I get along fine with Republicans. You know, we don't agree about certain things and some things we don't agree a lot, but hey, we're people. 
and we live in this community and we both want in our own way to make this life better for ourselves, for our families, for our friends, for our neighbors and so forth. So that becomes the common denominator and uh, it might make a big difference in the world, no, but it might make a difference among a small number of people here and there who might in turn do their own thing and, and make that difference. So everything you brought up is very important and it should be addressed. Um, one more one more point uh, before we move on to the uh, the rest of the uh, the ninety minutes, and that is robots that are replacing people as love objects. And I have seen uh, yeah. on the internet uh, they look like real women and real men. They are full size. They they their skin is soft. They have what looks like real hair, and they can talk and move and uh, and it's, it's it's scary how real how real they have become they have been engineered and now there are places on this planet where you can go into what would be a brothel but it's really staffed by robots that will help you to have a good time and this is just another Again, it's a moral question of where you stand on all this, and people have very different opinions on this. And uh, uh, but the, the bottom line is, it's not real. It's it's a robot uh, stepping in for a real person, and I think that's something to watch because that can have so again some red flags are are already in the air on this on this particular issue also. And that's a topic for another day uh, as well. Unfortunately, the show's format and topic uh, allow us to cover it. Uh, and uh, um, at this particular point in the development of those things, they're, they're kind of like, uh, um, they, they don't have a lot of intelligence. They don't have a lot of AI. They're, they kind of take the place of those love dolls that they had back in the day or might still have that were like balloons where you blew them up and, you know, they're along that level of development at this particular point in time. Uh, it does bring up ethical questions. In some countries in the Orient, you can marry uh, your uh, sex uh, uh, companion robot. Uh, wow. I, I didn't know that. That, that, okay. that puts it on a whole other level. Wow. But we will touch upon that in another day. Okay. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have an hour and a half. I just tag an extra 15 minutes in case we need Oh, it. I didn't know that. I know that everybody has to run usually around 10. So we will close with uh, two things. Number one, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask uh, someone else on the panel? Everybody gave phenomenal uh, um, presentations and each one uh, was a different facet of this uh, big uh, topic that we're just beginning to touch upon. There's just one thing uh, I just wanted to put out there to whoever could answer this. And that is, uh, I've been seeing that uh, there is now being developed, and I'm sure that this has been going on on other planets forever, uh, artificial wombs where a baby can be formed by an artificial womb, that a woman does not have to carry the child to, to, to being born. And in a way, that's good for the woman because that's a huge amount of pain and suffering, of course. I always thought that was very unfair that the woman has to go through that and the man doesn't. That, there's something about that that just kind of doesn't add up. But but the uh, the idea that uh, artificial wombs and I've, I've been seeing it, I'm sure you have also seen stories where, where uh, aliens uh, can have duplicates, uh, clones. That are, and I just wanted to ask if anybody has any, any uh, uh, idea about that subject. How far has this gone? Um, either either uh, for our ET friends or or for this planet. Um, I guess I'm unmuted now. Um, guys, I, the artificial womb idea, maybe those um, physical dense um, low uh, and gray types or whatever will do that kind of stuff and create hybrid things. But the way of life on the physical densities that's dense like ours here and other theoretical level, but near ours right here, um, life is very sacred and precious and, and unique. And um, when a soul comes into a physical body, um, it's chosen to come in, et cetera, or choose that time. So being within the mother is a whole connection that occurs. And, and while 
having been on other planes where children were or are, uh, watching what goes on, children are not in a womb uh, for nine months on Earth time. It would be a shorter time, but oh, okay. And um, the connection between the parents is very important. They usually understand the soul that's coming in, usually someone they've known maybe, or they've connected to to have that life. And the connection between the mother and the baby forming is super important with frequency and the love and the energy it feels, the sounds, the things that are happening, they can hear everything. Plus the parents are very telepathic on these other realms. So they're talking to the child who can go out of body like I was doing as well. So there's a whole thing with that. So having an artificial energy, even though it has all the fluids it needs, it's lacking the conscious frequency between the blood of the mother and the blood circulating, which has consciousness from the mother or the soul and the baby's consciousness too. So there's a whole thing of connection and learning that goes on. And um, so the gang upstairs is saying, it's not looked on in, in the high realms as, uh, as when they do that, they know they're usually robotic or making body, what do you call it, uh, clone like children or something, but that's programmable and it's kind of creepy because that's why those grays would have you a, a woman come out. We've known people who've had this happen where they've taken and they hold the baby, give them a baby to hold. They want to see how the mother is supposed to interact with the baby because they can't do it. And they lack emotion for that, some of those uh, species. So that's what they're trying to watch. So they're trying to make a hybrid between our kind of thinking or being or human with, with theirs so they can get a little bit of that emotion. emotional or compassion or something come into their frequency or their body form, which they lost along the way, a long time. So I'm just letting anybody listening, there is, um, and people who are listening, is a, a frequency and a consciousness with the blood of our bodies that is exchanged as well with the child. And there's a frequency going on with love, emotion, telepathy, the baby hears. I remember hearing inside the womb. So uh, when I came in eight months, but I heard that. I heard talking and voices and music. So when they play music, they hear that. And when you're talking, they hear that. Um, when you're arguing, they might kick around maybe, but <laughs> the baby. So it's very important. Um, so they, uh, the higher dimensional planes of beings on these higher etheric levels as well would, would not agree with um, putting uh, a, a life into an artificial way. Uh, and on Earth, they do it right. They do a little bit of a test tube, but they might implant it into a surrogate if the mother can't carry. So the surrogate, still there's things going on. And I heard that some of the people will tell them what they want that surrogate to listen to or TV shows to watch so that baby's not freaked out with evil sounds or whatever. So it's all it all works like that. And since life is sacred, there is a bond. And don't forget, souls have come in as males and females, males and females and born. So everybody somewhere has had a baby and birthed it in some level, somewhere a plane or even a physical plane on Earth like uh, thousands of years ago or, or hundreds of years ago. And so that, that's my take on what they were telling me for Nick, because uh, um, artificial is not the way to go. And you know what I heard, Hercules, when you were talking, the, the group, they were saying they were trying on Earth, they're trying to make people more robotic -y, like canceling out what you say, Nick, but they were saying, you know, it's wiping you out. So now you have only a certain program you can follow to confuse, distort your thinking and control. And that's, um, that's why they're doing this on the internet. And they also said that look in the future, not too far either, that the crews on the, uh, the ships around our planet that are high dimension, they're dimensionals in the fourth plane and all, but they will be able to use our TVs, radios, and computers to communicate a message when the time is coming, that they are coming to help in some way. But uh, again, they've always told me, we wait for most of the, the, the planet's leaders to call out for help. So. It's kind of rough to see that they're so arrogant in their power and not losing power and all this and keeping their weapons and this that they won't allow to come the help to come here for us and and really we should be out there already this was plan they wanted that back in the 50s early 50s but uh, they choose eisenhower knows what they didn't want it right mark thank you so much for that that really does enlighten the subject quite a bit. Thank you. Other, other one I thought of uh, for Hercules was Gollum. Remember Gollum? I thought you would hit on that. Lord of the Rings? 
no, well, the golems. Um, oh, the golems, yeah. The, yeah they were statues, using that. The animated statues, yes. Yeah, they were using that. So I think that, that covered some of the things you were saying, too. Well, th this opens up a whole new uh, category because we talked about the programmability of consciousness and how consciousness can enter a machine uh, and, yeah. and so forth. Uh, and that, that yeah. ties into this question, too, about uh, raising babies naturally or uh, artificially and... Uh, and uh, the things that get imprinted into babies by being in a biological body and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we'll have to put this. I was going to show. Oh, you know, I, I was trying to show before I forgot. That's a chair. That's me actually in the chair. Those are my friends and crew in the background. But um, that is one of the chairs we sit on on the Arcabana. You could sit on that. And if you're in that chair, and there's just a couple of little lights on the side. That's your signature pattern into the chair. The ship knows who you are, who's running it today, or who's getting the information today for about three hours. We take turns. Everybody takes turns. And you can actually you know, be there, sit on the ship. They'll show you how it works and how to connect to it. And if you're new, uh, the, the other crew members will be there to help focus with you. But if you're visiting or something, uh, that's on these other realms too. So it's uh, these chairs, they just, just sit down and I'm like, whoa, they're on you. They, you can molds to you. It's amazing. It's wonderful. And and uh, that's how you connect in. That's one of the ways to connect in. And the ship is telepath as well with you and the crew who's running with you on the front first line there of the ship. And then other people take over. Their times of work and things are different than our times on Earth. It's like three hours roughly. Another couple hours go Earth time hours. You think of time. They don't have that there, but it's a time. They show me how it works. And then uh, go those three hours or four hours it's in then it's basically learning and going different places you can go but that's your trainings and teachings and then you can do it with the trainings thank you mark and again, show another, that. another uh, topic we can devote episodes to thank you so very much tim did you want to take a stab at the answering that as well no nope, nope i think that uh, uh, uh mark did an excellent job with that yes he did uh, okay, if everyone can share their contact information, we'll start with uh, Mark and Phyllis again. How can people get in contact with you? Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, it's just our regular uh, main website, intergalacticmission.com. And again, I had said this yesterday for our friends. Uh, they put up a sign that says, oh, it's, out, it's not a safe site. It is. They just did that because we didn't pay a fee. So just keep continue, or continue, and go. <laughs> and it'll be the site. Um, they might have done it to a few of our sites. So that's how you reach us, Mark, with a C, Brinkerhoff, B-R-I-N-K-E-R-H-O-F-F, at yahoo.com is the internet uh, email to get us at. And etuniversalzone.com is another site. And my art site is markbrinkerhoff.com. And you're also on Facebook. And very Around very Facebook, and I'm ready for readings or whatever you. people call them, consultations. I call them spiritual consultations. I can see auras, uh, nature kingdom, uh, your past lives. Interpret your dreams just like that with the people and um, your archangels, uh, friends and guardian angels working with you and your your name and space of your soul out there when you're in space away from planets and Earth. And, and so I get all the names and um, people, have, you know, told me they had out of bodies and they were, that was their name. <laughs> and so there it was. But uh, that's that's what I do. And I'm available for that. And we're, we're, we're grateful you. for it. Thank you so very much, Mark and Phyllis. Um, Tim, how can people reach you? You can find all of my books on Amazon.com. Uh, a lot of these books also have uh, chapters uh, by other people, including Hercules. Uh, we've got a, uh, a new book that should be coming out in the next couple of weeks or so called Alien wow. Artifacts. Again, there's an excellent art, uh, chapter in this by uh, Hercules. So uh, uh, be on the lookout for Alien Artifacts. My website is conspiracyjournal.com, and uh, it's got all the uh, uh, strange, weird, and interesting news that they won't, don't want you to know. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I love that laugh, Tim. <laughs> and Tim is also on Facebook, too. And last, but certainly not least, the one, the only, Nick Curdo. Wow, wow. Okay, thank you. Um, the easiest way to do that is my in my email address, which is N-I-C-K-N-Y-N-Y-1, and that's one, the number one, not O-N-E, at 
gmail.com. Again, Nick, N-Y-N-Y-1 at gmail.com. Uh, the website is dnny.org. And that is for Disclosure Network New York. And that is a UFO, ET, and uh, a paranormal phenomenon group now celebrating our 21st year. And the good news is that October, we're going to be meeting face to face again for regular meetings. Awesome. And we will also have a, uh, a Zoom, a Zoom uh, meeting also each month. So we'll have a face to face meeting and a Zoom meeting. That's fantastic. Uh, more uh, DNNY goodness. And you also hold meetings uh, with uh, the Urantia book, uh, which is Cosmic Spirituality. Uh, and uh, for those who are interested in uh, uh, the contactee uh, phenomenon, uh, that is a wealth of information contained in a very thick uh, and heavy book. Uh, thank you very much to everybody. You're awesome. I enjoyed our conversation. I look forward to our next one. And to everyone who's going to tune in on YouTube after midnight tonight, joyous journeys. Thanks for joining us and amazing adventures. And uh, I updated my uh, Zoom account so I can't find any of the buttons. So let's see if this uh, uh, terminates for today. Yes, I do.